So, can you name this mountain? Um, it is one of the most hotly contested places of real estate on earth, as well as the most valuable. Uh, it is considered sacred by Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Thank you. <laughs> Get a cookie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mount, Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. <clears throat> Uh, and it also means place of provision. Um, and of course, I'm teaching on the Lord sees and provides Jehovah Jireh. Um, later on, it is at this mount is where Abraham was told by God to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And then later, it is at this same location that David instructed his son Solomon to build the temple where sacrifices were made. And then, much later, it was also the general area where God's only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was sacrificed. Uh, we're going to go to Genesis 22 here in just a moment. The sacrifices in the Old Testament were temporary in nature. Uh, the atonement for sin offering for the people was good for just one year. It was temporary. You had to, you had to keep doing it. Um, a repeat performance was necessary, and it is at this mountain, Mount Moriah, um, some of you know we named our daughter that, not the mount part, but the... <laughs> <laughs> it is at this mountain <laughs> where God is referred to specifically as Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord sees and provides. So in Genesis 22, verse 1, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. See how polite this conversation is back and forth. <laughs> Verse 2, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, you know, the one you love, and get thee into the land of Mor Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. How much trust Abraham had to have in what God said. How would you respond to the son, the only son that you love? Verse 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of the young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto the young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Why did he say that? He, yeah, but he's saying, I and the lad is going to come back. Yeah, he's coming. So could it be that he believed God would raise son, his son Isaac from the dead? Knowledge of the resurrection had a history throughout the Bible. Abraham knew about it, and it's very likely. Uh, going back to the time of the fall, they knew about it as well. This record here is a precursor to the resurrection of Christ that God would provide a sufficient sacrifice. The only way that Abraham had this kind of spiritual insight was that he had to be close to God. How can anyone know the in-depth spiritual realities of sacrifices and the resurrection unless they are tight with the Father? Abraham was used to sacrificing a lamb, an animal, and to God, but here he's about to take it to a whole new level with his son being the human sacrificial lamb. How could you do such a thing unless you believed that God was going to raise him from the dead? Was he also not told, in Isaac shall thy seed be called? Um, in other words, you're going to have descendants through Isaac, and if you sacrifice him, how can that be? Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and again, here we go. And he said, Here am I, my son. So polite. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Hmm. Um, and Abraham said, My son, God will provide... There's that word provide, himself a lamb for a burnt offering. 
So they went, both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called upon him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast with, not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Was God looking for Abraham to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only? And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up, him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham, <clears throat> pardon me. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Taking the word provide from verse 8 that we saw earlier and combining it here with it shall be seen, in verse 14 we can translate Jehovah Jireh as the Lord sees and provides. Look at how Abraham had to trust God with every word from him and do it and perform it. His relationship with God is not impossible, but certainly one we can aspire to. Could you do that? Um, I don't want to just keep things in my head regarding to the Word, right? We want to be able to do things with that Word that we have. The sacrifices here of Abraham's only son was a precursor to the ultimate sacrifice of God's only begotten Son, whom He provided, Jesus Christ. Sacrifices for sin have always been required since the fall of man back in the garden. God's test of Abraham's faith proved here that Abraham was ready to do the will of God, regardless of who or what the sacrifice was. Can you imagine the relief in Abraham's mind when he was stopped from slaying his son whom he loved, and then in his place God provided a ram at the right moment? You might just be inspired to call the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord sees and provides. <laughs> <clears throat> Yes, our God provides. We are reminded in Romans 15.4 that these lessons in the Old Testament are for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Do you see our hope right here in Genesis 22? Jesus Christ. He is the red thread woven in all 66 books of the Bible. Here in the book of Genesis, Christ is Abraham's sacrifice. If we look for Christ throughout the Bible, we have hope. <clears throat> There's a number of things here that can point to Christ. The sacrifice for sin points to who? Christ. Great, right. okay, thank you. <laughs> the angel of the Lord interceding on God's behalf like Christ who intercedes for us points to who? Christ. Abraham's hope that God would raise his son from the dead points to who? God providing a ram in the place of Isaac, like Christ took our place, points to who? And one more maybe, if you look at the next chapter, it talks about Sarah being 127 when she died, which might put Isaac at about age 30. I don't know. I don't know if you see a similarity there, but okay. The more I see Christ, it's, I, I couldn't pinpoint the exact age, but it's pretty close. Uh, the more I see Christ in each and every book, the more my identity in Christ becomes alive in my walk. The practical application here is that in each and every situation in my life where challenges appear, physical, financial, emotional, mental, my God, my Jehovah Jireh will see and provide for me. Psalm 23. Aaron, you did a great job of covering the I shall not want. Um, 23.1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
right? That is Jehovah Jireh. And probably someone at some point will go through this psalm and show you how many there are in here, um, is my guess. But he is my Jehovah Jireh. He provides, therefore I shall not want. One translation renders this, I shall uh, I shall not want is I shall lack nothing. There is not one thing that Jehovah Jireh does not provide. He covers all areas. He does not withhold any good thing. Psalm 34. Uh, verse 9, O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Verse 10, The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Look at the latter part of verse 10 again. The only requirement is that you seek the Lord. The result, you shall not lack any good thing. Is that pretty easy? Yeah. What a partnership. It's like God's doing all the work in this partnership. <laughs> Seek him and you have no want. Um, Philippians 4. thought you were going to steal all my thunder, Aaron. But <laughs> Philippians 4. Verse 19, most of you probably know it by heart. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that need has to be more than enough. It can't be just barely, like you said, living by the river. You know, it has to be a lot bigger than that. Because if you don't have more than enough, how could you possibly give? How can you help someone else? You can't. Here he shall supply all your need, Psalm 23, I shall lack nothing, Genesis, Genesis 22, 14, it was Jehovah Jireh as he sees and provides. He is a God that provides for me again and again. He is always there and never leaves my side. I sense his presence. I know many times when I am busy working and switch thoughts and then turn his way and think about him, he was already there. He beat me to the meeting. <laughs> that spiritual awareness comforts me. My biggest fear has always been being alone, and yet I don't have to ever go it alone because he told me he will always be there for me. These kind of simple, simple reminders heal my heart and encourage me to tell others of his love and concern. When I am convinced that he sees and provides for me, I have an ultimate, an intimate rather, loving peaceful, and dynamic relationship with my God right now. To take this practical application further, I can tell others about this most wonderful God, one who can pro provide for them, who can help guide, and gives of himself. In all these seven redemptive names of God, where God is in relationship to his creation, do you notice that in none of them does God take from the believer? In each and every one, Jehovah is giving us something. He is my peace. He is my shepherd. He sees and provides. He is my righteousness. He is present to heal. He is present to bless, and he is my banner or canopy. Do you see the pattern? <laughs> He's a God that gives. He's a God that provides. He's a God of power. How do I access this power? Well, all of God's power to us is based on promises from Him. He made a way to allow humanity to access power by two simple things. He makes a promise, and we believe the promise. <laughs> How complex is that? <laughs> There's so much simplicity from all an all-powerful God. Throughout the ages, throughout administrations, this has been the simple requirement for God's created people to have power and to walk with Him. Psalm 107, if you would. We're going to see how this Jehovah Jireh is related to healing.
Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and what? And delivered them from their destructions. All deliverance, all healing is based upon promises of God from his word, whether written or verbal. When we believe a promise, we receive the benefit. My Jehovah provides healing. Look at 1 Peter 2. We in the back. First Peter 2.24 Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. This promise of God has two elements. One, the forgiveness of sin uh, by the shedding of perfect blood. And then number two, healing for your body by Christ's broken body. Christ accomplished this for us. It is legally ours today. So then on what basis did Jesus do healings in the Gospels if his blood was not yet shed and his body was not yet broken? No. <laughs> that's, that's part of it, yeah. yeah. Um, or even prior to the Gospels in the Old Testament, on what basis was healing done? Matthew 9. Let's look at a record here where Jesus did something and said something. <laughs> Matthew 9, verse 1, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came unto his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Why did he say that? And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think you evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. Which one's easier? <laughs> But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Jesus couldn't take them, the religious leaders, too far. He, I mean, to sit and explain, look, when sins are removed, you can receive healing healing. He couldn't go there. He couldn't go there. Which is easier to say? Sin be forgiven, thee arise and walk. Jesus related sins being forgiven with healing here in the Gospels before he was sacrificed. How could this be? He has not accomplished redemption yet. He's, trying to, he's tying the two together, and he has not yet been sacrificed. But there's another element here that we cannot let get away from us, and that is in verse 2, and Jesus seen their what? Thank you, Jerry. He saw their what? Believing. Yeah, they were believing a promise of God through Jesus that this sick one could be healed. They brought this guy to Jesus laying on a bed based upon their faith. I mean, if you're going to bring a guy to someone to get healed, isn't there a level of believing that's happening on the way to the guy? Jesus? You know, I would say everyone with him, including a guy on the bed. Could it, not, could it be that when you believe God at his word, that you can have both forgiveness of sins and healing? This two-part legal reality must be taken to the next level of healing by simply believing, by faith. The man, sick of the palsy, believed the promise of God. Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. So he believed a promise of God, and he got both forgiveness of sin and healing. Jesus said it, <clears throat> but it was by revelation a promise made by God. Can you tell someone that your sins are forgiven? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that blasphemy? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 
my Jehovah provides, right? How about healing of Naaman's leprosy prior to the Gospels and prior to man's redemption? What was that based on? Let's look at Naaman, uh, first, uh, second, uh, yeah, second Kings. Second Kings 5. Second Kings 5, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses. Of course, he's looking for healing. He's going to the man of God. He heard he, had, he could get healed if he went there. He came with his horses and with his chariot and stood by the door of the house of Elijah the prophet. Verse 10. And Elijah sent a messenger. Hmm. You know, someone with an ego is going to be offended. <laughs> And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wrought, and went away. And behold, I thought he surely would come out, him, the prophet himself, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over this place and recover the left. How many times have we thought, this is how the prayer should be answered, and this is how I want it. When I don't get it this way, God must not be listening, or he didn't hear my prayer, or maybe I'm not believing, you know. So, yeah, so, yeah same thing here. And verse 12, Are not Abana and far, far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, person with sense here, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather would he saith unto thee, Wash and be clean? Verse 14, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Healing is based on believing God at His Word. It's that simple. Throughout the ages, God has made that simple requirement to access healing and the power of God. The Word of God said, dip seven times, and when He did, He received His healing. Psalm 107 said, if you remember, He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. Matthew 10. Matthew 10, 1, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power, exercised power, against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. They could go out and perform this power because it was freely given to them. They had the right to do this from God. Verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received. Freely give. We've seen a lot of that here. Um, even being raised from the dead, we've seen that in this group. This was Jesus' instructions to the twelve. It's free. How much of this is ours today? All of it, yeah. Remember John 14, 12 says, the works that Christ did we can do also. Look at chapter 9 here. Chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. He taught the word and he healed every sickness and every disease. Did he give anyone a disease? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, give you this. No, um, not once. And yet, so many times we see when we talk to people, they are hung up on maybe it's the will of God for me to be in this situation. Is it the will of God for me to be healed? Is it the will of God for me to be healed now? All these questions, and yet it's very clear. And back to chapter 8, 
in Matthew. In verse 16, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Here again, the two elements. Forgiveness of sin allows healing in your body. All that they brought to him, he healed, every one of them. Even the prophet Isaiah, the Old Testament, ties together sin and sickness. And yet these healings took place before man's completed redemption. How about after man's completed redemption? Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 9, 19, rather. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power, dunamis, to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. This power is given to us right now in part because Christ, uh, through Christ because of the resurrection. The resurrection added power that was limited in the Old Testament. Let's look at the resurrection a little, a little deeper. So in the record we looked at in Genesis 22, where Abraham was told to sacrifice his son Isaac, we see the first mention of a resurrection in Scripture regarding human life. The replacement for Isaac, the ram that was sacrificed, did not get up from the dead. Did it? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Animals don't have the same value as human life, do they? No. God gives humans hope. He doesn't with animals. Okay. With a resurrection. The next record, speaking of a human resurrection, is in Psalm 16, where David mentions it. Look at uh, Psalm 16. You can certainly pray for your cute little animals. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do, but there are some limitations. Psalm 16 and verse 8, David says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart was glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in what? Mm, he was looking forward to something. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Shoal, the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one, who is, thank you, to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness forever. Oh, let's see. Fullness of joy at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Look at uh, Psalm 49, since we're so close there. Psalm 49, verse 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. David knew that his body was not going to stay in the grave, but that one day God would get him up. Additionally, he knew in Psalm 16 that we read that, we read that the Holy One Christ would not see corruption because he also would be raised from the dead. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, others speak of a raising or a resurrection. During Jesus' time on earth, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. They were so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Matthew 22. Can I go to about 12.15, or is that too long? Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, 
Matthew twenty-two twenty-three. 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Moses, Master Moses, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. And there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and had no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second, third, unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. <laughs> Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That's what the angel said, too, when Mary got to the grave, right? Why seek you the living among the dead? He's up. Do you know that that stone wasn't rolled away because Jesus had to get out? <laughs> Just so the women could get in. Yeah. Do you think Jesus was kept in there by that stone? <laughs> He could go all over the place. I don't think, uh, you know, yeah, you know why it was rolled. <laughs> Verse 33, and when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. So Jesus reminded them that the resurrection is mentioned in the Old Testament because he said they were in error, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The power of God is mentioned specifically here relating to the resurrection from the dead. That's the kind of God I want for my life. Do you want one that can raise people from the dead? Can you name any religion out there that can do such a thing? No. No. Well, there's no love or anything else <laughs> over there. Um, Peter talked about this on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. That's where we're going to go. They had just received the gift of Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And others heard them speak in tongues, and they asked, What meaneth this? Never heard that before. Acts 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 21, And it came to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God, verse 24, raised up having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my, on my right hand, that I shall not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also, my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. He's over there. He's not up. <laughs> he's dead. And as a time, he's going to get up. But right now, he's what? He's dead. Yeah. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, 
that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Twice he's saying that. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. Of all things to say that day, look how he's tying the sacrifices of the Old Testament, things that David looked forward to, the hope of being raised from the dead, speaking in tongues. What meaneth this? And he just explains it so beautifully, how you can tie speaking in tongues with, from basically Abraham all the way through, seeing sacrifices, seeing the resurrection from the dead, and here it all culminates on this day. They just spoke in tongues. So what does this speaking in tongues mean? Peter tells them about the prophet of Joel predicting that God would pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. Here it is today. Then he explains that this new life in people would be contingent upon a resurrection, a resurrection of the dead body that did not see corruption. Twice here, Peter speaks of Christ's body not seeing corruption, referring back to Psalm 16 and David. Did David's body see corruption? Mm -hmm. Christ's body was in the grave three days and three nights. The normal process of a dead body is to see corruption, to decompose from the time you die, right? God left Christ's body for three days and three nights in the grave to legally fulfill the requirement that he was dead. All other bodies decompose from the moment they die. Remember Lazarus? <laughs> Christ's body did not see corruption. There was no separation from God. Christ knew before he died that God would resurrect him. Our bodies have sinned, and they're going to decompose. Christ's flesh did not see it. Christ in his resurrected body, whatever form that is now, is the one who is going to get us up at the gathering. God provided the way out of death. This resurrection stung the devil in his constant desire and lust for death. The resurrection would cancel the legal right Satan had of killing God's people one by one. Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, Christ, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of the death of death, that is, the devil. Jesus died so that he could take part in this legal requirement by being like you and me, dying, being in the grave, completely dead. Then he could say to the devil, I have conquered death and I have defeated you. <laughs> Being born of Mary, his mother, he took part in the same life that you and I live by coming forth from his physical mother. Then when Christ died, he took part in death just like you and me so that he could legally redeem us from the power and clutches of Satan. Satan legally owned us before that. Jehovah Jireh provided a way out. <laughs> Hebrews 2, verse 8. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing. Jehovah Jireh left nothing. I shall not want. That is not under him, put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, because there's more to come. Verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. His love did this for all of us. He knew what he was accomplishing for all who would accept his accomplishment. God didn't leave one legal requirement untouched. His son did a complete job. Romans 10, you know it by heart. 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So much is based on the resurrection and confessing Jesus as Lord. Those two things. The resurrection from the dead was known for thousands of years, and God places the simplicity of receiving all the benefits, privileges, rights relating to it through His Son here in one verse. God made it so easy to participate in this new membership. Are you a member? <laughs> Our provider's love is so big and so giving towards us. During Christ's presence here on earth, over 500 brethren witnessed him in his resurrected body. <clears throat> they walked with him and referred to him as Lord. He was their master. He guided them to the Father. The two contingencies on being saved, they had already met. So then on the day of Pentecost, it was so easy for them to speak in tongues. They had called him master, and they had seen him resurrected. They were ready. Their hearts were ready. They knew. They spoke it forth. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> Pardon me. Christ accomplished all... Since we were not of the over 500 that personally saw him, we do have a very personal and undeniable witness of His resurrection when we speak in tongues, just as they did back then. Christ accomplished all the redemptive names of God. That's why they are called redemptive names, because of His what? Redemption. It's complete, and so are we now. With that Spirit in us, we have all the redemptive names of Jehovah in us via Holy Spirit right now. He is my peace. He is my shepherd. He sees and provides. He is my righteousness. He is present to heal. He is present to bless, and He is my banner or canopy. Seven of them, spiritual perfection. They didn't have food. Christ provided food. They were sick. Christ healed them. They were in a boat in a storm. Christ covered for them. He is a complete Savior. What do you need? He is Jehovah Jireh. He will see and provide. Do you trust Him with these things? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God says it first, then it is established in our walk, in what we see and do. The more we walk the Word of God, the more obvious our believing becomes evident. Abraham's faith was tested. His works exposed his faith. Wouldn't it be great if we had a gauge or a barometer to measure our faith or believing? We do. We do. Look at James. James 2.14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith saving? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, But depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Your works will reveal your internal believing, your faith is what he's saying. When you are so excited about the Word of God that it permeates your heart, that Word has to eventually manifest itself in our walk. That's how works can reveal your faith. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and have not works, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. What I like to you know, walk in a room, devils are trembling. Right? Verse 20, 
But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? His works revealed his faith. He wasn't justified by works only. They were together. It's true. It's still true that Abraham believed God, and that's how he obtained righteousness. It wasn't works that obtained his righteousness, but his works revealed his believing. It was the evidence of works that revealed the believing in his heart. Verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought his works, and by, faith, by works his faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see, see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, and she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and what? Not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See, faith leads to action. The action reveals your faith. It's a gauge of what's going on on the inside. Now, I can study the Word for years, and I can keep it up here, but you know what could happen? I could just get egotistical. As I practice, receive, retain, release, then I'm able to see the Word in action. Right? When I trust what God says, my believing and trusting God will manifest itself in my walk. If I trust God to be my provider, my Jehovah Jireh, I will see the evidence in action. This is not just a doctrine, but life. Jesus said that when he came, to the, he said that we might have life in all its fullness. Not just a head knowledge. We're to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Why did God wait to see the action of Abraham about to sacrifice his son before he stopped him? I don't know the answer. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. There's a carrot and then took it away. Um, was, he, <clears throat> was he looking for Abraham to be a doer of the word? Maybe. Why would I want to keep all this wealth of information to myself? If I had a million dollars in my pocket, which I don't at the moment, <laughs> and every time I kept giving it away, God kept filling my pockets again and again, and I never ran out. Would I maybe share this wealth with someone? And really, if you think about it, you only need a dollar on that principle, you know? If he's going to keep refilling it. When I open my mouth and tell someone about him, that he has an endless supply, that he can heal them, that he could provide all the finances in the world to just them if they need it, could I do that in love? How many people do you think right now are hurting in a mile radius of where we're sitting right now? Who's going to reach them? Who's going to love them? I just don't want these words on the pages of the Bible to be in my mind only. I want these holy words to come out of my, of my mouth and manifest themselves in my holy life to help others in their life too. And when I do that, I grow. I can tell them some of the wonderful things that God has done for me. Some of the most awesome testimonies for other people are, is really what God's done for you. Very personal. And you can make it live and you can tell them of it with believing. God provides for me in magnificent ways again and again. He has given me spiritual life, a connection with Him, and I get guidance from him daily that benefit me and my family. I take my relationship with him very serious because he is never wrong. <laughs> 29 years ago, he showed me who to marry. And she is still the love of my life. I have the best mother-in-law anyone could ask for, who loves God and lives with us in our large, happy home. He gave us four wonderful children who continue to make wise decisions that we are so proud of. They have a drive and determination with great worth ethic and show great compassion to others, and all of them love God. 
God has financially blessed us beyond what I could ever imagine, and we are healthy. My heart's desire is for others to come to that knowledge of God and to allow Him to bless their lives. When I go into people's homes as a handyman in my business, I pray with them. They text me back and tell me how God is blessing them. Thanks, Joe. I got the job we prayed for. I understand that I don't have a career, but I have a position of influence. I go up to total strangers and ask them if I can pray for them. Most of them say yes. Hi, my name is Joe. I'm a minister. Do you have something I can pray for? I invite people to lunch two or three times a week. I'm giving you ideas if you haven't seen them. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, and I have their undivided attention. Would you have somebody's undivided attention if you're buying lunch? They can't get away. They want to... <laughs> I used to run from the home homeless when they'd start approaching me across the parking lot. And now I looked them straight in the eye and I don't, I'm, can I pray for you? Look, let's pray and we'll see what I could do after that. But we lead it. <laughs> Somebody else doesn't lead it. We're walking with God. And obviously they're not. Um, because I open my mouth and pray with them, eight people have been physically delivered in the last two months. From knees healed instantly to backs, one guy's hips were healed. He couldn't even stand up while I was ministering to him. That night he slept for the first time throughout the night without taking any pain medication. And the next day he walked around with no problems. One day I had prayed for God to send me someone to to pray for and to bless. Then out of the blue, this older guy literally ran into my truck with his bicycle. <laughs> I prayed with him and his arthritis left immediately. Oh, wow. For so long, I waited for God to tell me when to speak to people. I thought I needed this urge, you know, to open my mouth and share of his love. And yet the Word of God has already given us this revelation by telling us that each and every one of us has the ministry of reconciliation. Don't have to wait, do we? Yeah, I need that urge. No, I don't. <laughs> I got it already. It's written. I was afraid to speak at times because I thought, what if I don't see results as I pray with them? Well, the pressure is not on me to perform. Um, the pressure is on God to perform and the individual to believe. My heart was to do this with no strings attached, and I wanted them to see that I didn't want anything in return, that I just wanted to love them. That's how I approach each and every one of these. I, I, my intention is not to get them to fellowship or anything. I just want to love you. What can I do to love you? Can I minister to you? What do you need? I want to pray for you with that. And boy, you know, when you sit with someone and you've got your hand on their back and they're just letting you, and they're opening their heart to you, that moment is so intimate and so special that you're able to bring some type of deliverance to them at that moment. Well, this has been multiplying to the point where people are starting to come to fellowship now as a result. So, and before I didn't see hardly any results, but it's, it's got to be love. It has to be that motivation to be able to touch somebody else's heart that I don't have any ulterior motive other than I just want to bless you. Sometimes it has been just a simple intimate prayer. Other times it have been time to share the scriptures. My boldness has grown and my relationship with my Father has never been better. He is the Lord who sees and provides. This was my way to kind of grow with my Father, and I hope you understand that, that that's my heart in sharing some of these things with you. And people are so ready to hear about Him. May we all walk with our Jehovah Jirah. Thank you, Jirah.